Ian. So, uh, this evening we're very pleased to welcome Heather, Heather Stewart, hey. uh, for two reasons really. Um, the first one is directly to do with the society itself, which is that Heather is the relatively new chief, is that chief editor? Yeah, or, or editor-in-chief. Edit editor-in-chief. Dictator oh, for sounds, life, you know, I'll take that, that too. Sounds even more <laughs> important. <laughs> uh, of the Scottish Journal of Geology, which is uh, jointly owned by the Glasgow and Edinburgh Geological Societies. Uh, so Colin Braithwaite was the previous editor for going back to the Silurian period, <laughs> yeah. approximately. Uh, and now it's, it's, it, this is Heather's role. So that this, this is a way in which the two societies still keep engaged in supporting uh, forefront uh, geological research, um, and particularly in Scotland. But also, uh, uh, Heather um, is now working as she's the deputy director of the Mindaroo University uh, of Western Australia Deep Sea uh, Research Centre. And um, right round this side of the planet from there, about halfway round back from there, uh, is running an outfit called Kelpie Geoscience. Um, uh, and previously, I think you, as you said earlier on, you're a graduate of this university mm -hmm. and you spent quite a long time working for the British Geological Survey yeah. in Edinburgh, I think? Yes. Yeah, yeah. In, in Edinburgh. So, so, um, we're now, you know, we often hear about geology uh, that you can walk around with with boots, which actually only covers about a third of the Earth's surface. So tonight we're going to hear about the other two thirds. So uh, over to you. Thank you very oh. much. No, thank you very much. <laughs> no for the, pressure. Yeah, yeah, no, no pressure. Thank you very much for the, the very kind introduction. Just check sound levels. Can you hear me at the back? I'm not like deafening people. No, OK, I won't kind of speak any louder. Um, thank you so much for the invite. and. As, as uh, Simon said, um, I, wa I spent 23 years at the British Geological Survey. Um, my usual stomping grounds were actually round about um, the, the continental shelf and deep water areas round about Scotland. Uh, I've done a lot of work uh, round about those areas, um, round about sort of down south as well, but you know, maybe sort of gloss over that a little bit. Um, but as of about 2015, I started um, doing, with the British Geological Survey's support, doing work in some of the deep water areas of some of our overseas territories. Um, and then sort of uh, that sort of morphed into becoming um, chief geologist and advisor for something called the Five Deeps Expedition that started in um, 2018. Um, on the back of that, um, I ended up uh, working for um, Inkfish, which the, the logo's on the, on the right there. But um, I, I took the, the rather scary um, decision, as I was sort of saying over dinner earlier, I just got to the stage that I was made a bit of an offer to jump into academia that I couldn't really sort of turn down. And I was sort of like, right, OK, well, if I don't go now, I'm going to be 45 years at BGS and I'll always think, what if? So um, I still, BGS is, is one of the most amazing research institutes that you can ever um, hope to, to work with. And, um, and we maintain those, those links today. So the abyss gazes also into you, and that's obviously a sort of hint at some of the, the deep water areas that I'm now working in. And I must have done, I don't know, maybe 20 odd expeditions now to some of the deepest points in our Earth. And a lot of those are you know, found at the tectonic, tectonic plate boundaries. So we're looking at subduction trenches and your mid-ocean ridges, and of course the flat, big abyssal plains in between. But um, Nietzsche, which the, the title came here, um, was from, and I've got the quote here, he who fights with monsters might take care lest he thereby become a monster. And when you gaze long into an abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. So thinking about that, this is uh, the big sort of white ship that we're looking down on there. That's the, the mighty ship Dagon that I spend an awful lot of time on, um, much to the disgruntlement of my two children. Uh, the little green blob just uh, to the bottom of it is a submersible, a two-person submersible called Bakunawa. Short, short name is uh, Baku. And, um, and sometimes when I'm gazing into the abyss through the, the portholes, um, what is gazing back are these little uh, star-shaped things. And that's an actual photo taken by my colleague Alan through the viewport of the submersible that we were in. So it's, it's not necessarily for the faint-hearted. And um, I'm going to touch upon quite a few elements of the recent research that we've been doing. Um, over the last year, we've completed three massive expeditions crossing the Pacific. 
um, in a feature called the Nova Canton Trough, which I'll talk about um, in a bit more detail shortly, and the Tonga Trench. Again, we're going to do a whistle stop tour of all of these areas. Um, but to sort of start off, I think that to put a little bit of context in the in the whole sort of talk, you know, and I think that we do need to look at, you know, the geology of Scotland is right there, you know, that's the, the most recent addition of a tome that has been going back a number of years. Um, we do need to sort of look back and see where we come from. So that historical perspective, in my opinion, is hugely important. So I'm not going to go right the way back to, you know, like Columbus and stuff, you know, we're probably going to do like, you know, 19th century onwards, but very whistle stop tour, I'm going to cherry pick along the way. But by the 1850s, um, vessels, uh, we'd been routinely crossing the oceans for more than 20, 200 years, right? That resulted that uh, the coastlines were quite well surveyed. There are a lot of very famous cartographers and a lot of very famous um, maps of the, of the coastlines of the world that are published. And actually, to be fair, a lot of the detail that is included in those coastlines are, you know, they're, they're pretty spot on. <laughs> you know, they were, they're, they're really, really good. But... Apart from how deep you could hold your breath, maybe, <laughs> the, the deeper waters over you know, maybe a few tens of metres were pretty unknown. And I think the assumption back then that you know, there was actually um, one of uh, a specific cartographer's role was to draw the, you know, the here be dragons images on those ancient maps. So the coastlines, super detailed, here be dragons, right? So we're in the dragons realm, really. Um, so beyond a few tens of metres, um, little was known, but I mean, as we were coming into the, the end of the 19th century, you know, military reasons, commercial reasons, telecommunications, we were needing to lay cables between Europe and North America. So all of these drivers started coming into force and starting to drive research and investigation in all of these here be dragons areas. So we start to, to sort of move forward. So if we think about, you know, 1773, Lord Mulgraves um, sounded the deepest known depth of the ocean at that time, 1,249 metres in the Arctic. That was very quickly um, beaten by Sir John Ross in the early 19th century, who in Baffin, Baffin uh, put my teeth back in, Baffin Bay, um, east of Greenland, um, using a wire with a clam grab on the end, took not only the depth um, of that, that area, 1,920, but also took a sediment grab in that location. Um, and using that sort of wire, um, which was traditionally marked every, I think, 100 fathoms, you know, to measure water depth, you know, that was, that was really quite um, sort of de rigueur at the time. You know, that was the, the modern technology. Everybody was using that. But it was quite an investment. Um, I think uh, Sir John Ross and then... Um, so James Clark, Clark Ross afterwards, he took six and a half kilometres of wire on his um, Erebus and Terror expeditions. And at that point, he sounded um, just over six and a half thousand metres on a long wire that was marked every hundred fathoms. So it wasn't cheap, you know, having all of that wire. It was a very big investment. The vessels were actually relatively small compared to what we use as a research vessel nowadays. And, um, and you know, so that, that sort of uh, frontier exploration at that time was, you know, it, it, it broke boundaries. So leaping forward a little bit, we are sort of covering quite a lot of ground quite quickly <laughs> to get onto the nice stuff uh, from, from more recent. But if we go on to the, the Challenger expedition, covered around uh, 70,000 nautical miles. Um, and they were using a vessel that they sort of kitted out. It was from the Royal Navy. They, Navy, they took, it, uh, took it on in 1872, um, gutted it, put uh, laboratories for doing sort of seafloor um, sampling, chemistry, biology. You know, so they really sort of pushed the boundaries. And of course, um, Charles Bible Thompson was um, part, of the, part of the forefront for that. Uh, Sir John Murray published the results in uh, 1895 and Oh, hang on, skipping forward. They recorded the deepest point at that time, just south of the uh, Mariana Isles in the Pacific Ocean, 8,200 nod metres. And of course, in the tradition of the time, they named that after the ship, so that became Challenger Deep, which of course we all now know now is the deepest point um, on Earth 
at 10,925 metres. So Sir John Murray, and again, just another quote, um, the Challenger expedition, he wrote, was the greatest advance in the knowledge of our planet since the celebrated discoveries of the 15th and 16th centuries. So, I mean, we really have to look at, you know, the investment and the years of exploration, sort of go around the globe and systematically acquire scientific data using the same vessel and the same materials and the same equipment. Not a lot of folk have done that since. Um, and Sir John Murray, of course, uh, led the, the publication of those, um, uh, those tomes. And um, he started to look at mapping the ocean in three dimensions. But as we sort of move on, we get to the, the end of the, the 19th, turn of the, the 20th century, and we start to look at new technology, new sounding devices were being developed by the, the British Royal Navy, for example, the Hydra Rod and the Bailey Rod. And, um, and those were used to great effect, in, again, in the Pacific Ocean, which we know now, of course, is this huge area of, sort of very dynamic tectonic plates. So, of course, we've got all these ultra-deep areas of the world. And HMS Penguin recorded the first depth, um, first really super deep uh, depth of just over 9,000 metres in the Kermadec Trench, which we now know is just over 10,000 metres. So this sort of, um, as we're sort of uh, trundling through the early part of the, the 20th century, you know, the, this new echo sounder method started becoming apparent. And, um, and I love the, the definition. This is actually, the underlying section is actually from a publication. So someone is throwing half pound blocks of TNT off the ship to create the sound source. I'd love to look at the risk assessment for that, right? <laughs> so, I mean, I've got to write loads of risk assessments and, I'd love to just sort of, you know, stand in there in your flip-flops or something, as they probably did, you know, just kicking TNT off the back of the ship. But that's a sound source, and they would measure the time it would take for that sound to travel through the water column, bounce off the seafloor, and come back up to the ship. And that would give you a point, and it would give you a fairly accurate water depth for that point. And um, the first people to actually use, this was developed by the military, of course, but the first people to actually use that for scientific research were the Germans. And they used it on, um, in the, the 1910s, I think it was 1914, um, to sound the deepest point in the Southern Ocean, actually Meteor Deep in the South Sandwich Trench. And you know what? They were two metres off. I went and surveyed it in 2019, and they were two metres off. They recorded 8,964 metres for Meteor Deep, and I was two metres deeper. So German efficiency. So and that was using TNT, uh, the new modern um, X sounder. Um, that same X sounder was used to very great effect by one of the sort of mid uh, 20th century uh, expeditions called Galathea, um, and that was uh, run by the the Danes. And they visited. They did a big global um, expedition, not unlike the Challenger expedition. And they started using the echo sounder to image some of these deep tectonic boundaries. And of course, this is in you know times where you know plate tectonics is still a little bit controversial. You know, so nobody's fully on board yet. So they start to ask questions. You know, why do we have you know a, a sort of steeper side of a trench and a, and a shallower sort of, uh, sloping side of the trench? But um, these images are from one of the Galathea reports on the right there um, of the Philippine Trench. And, you know, the, the water depths and the, the concepts that they were thinking about at that time still stand up today. So um, we're sort of uh, leaping forward to the mid um, uh, 20th century and Bruce uh, Hazine and uh, Mary Tharp. Um, they first published this map of the North Atlantic. That partnership began looking for downed World War II aircraft. And they started piecing together all of those point data uh, sources. And they produced this amazing map of the North Atlantic Ocean. And that was the first time that somebody had taken that sort of, that big regional perspective. And of course you do that, and it raised more questions than answers really. You know, what is that big mountain range that's going right down the middle? Is that where New Crust is made? You know, it's 200 years since James Hutton has come up with uh, the heat engine and such like. You know, so 
and plate tectonics, you know, is not accepted. And in fact, uh, it, Marie Tharp was, uh, was an early advocate of plate tectonics and um, Bruce uh, called it girl talk. You know, he's, he really sort of frowned upon it. He was not um, an early adopter of the theory. So um, where is uh, crust getting made? Where is it being recycled? You know, there's, there's no sort of obvious uh, sort of tectonic trenches in those um, in the North Atlantic there, as was the, the sort of random disparate mountain change, chains around about the Azores, for example, how are those formed? You know, so there's an awful lot of questions, but even today, that is an amazing, an amazing, amazing map. Um, you can put that on as a layer in Google Earth, in one of the historic uh, layers in there. And this was published 20 years later, and it was the very first global map of the world's oceans and you really start to get a proper feel for the fact that uh, well the world is made up of tectonic plates and there are boundaries around those plates the mid-ocean ridges um, are seen as a network you've got your um, your mountain chains like the like Hawaii your hotspot activity and you've got these thin gashes of ultra deep water around about areas that plates are being recycled. They're getting thrust back into the mantle and recycled. So this is still, I think, in my opinion, one of the most groundbreaking and amazing maps that has ever been produced. And, um, and I don't know if we'll ever sort of beat it, to be fair. But it was also one of the first um, early examples of uh, science collaboration and communication because the artist um, Heinrich Beran um, actually helped them produce that. So, I mean, it was a really early sort of uh, example of trying to communicate our own science to a wider audience. So, technology evolves. Um, you know, uh, multi-beam echo sounder is something that I use a lot nowadays. And um, it was, uh, I think it was, well, of course, it was developed by the military, of course. Uh, I think it was first used for commercial purposes in the sort of 70s and 80s. Um, but basically, instead of the your, your sort of TNT and your single point sources of sound um, scenario. Oh, that's meant to just keep on going. Oh, well. Um, we're, instead of just one point of sound, we're actually sending out a fan. So we're, instead of just getting, you know, one little line of information, we're getting this big corridor. And we kind of just go out and mow the grass, which is quite uh, relaxing until you realize that the weather's better in one heading and not the other. And then you really want to just keep on going in this way. <laughs> you know. But anyway, um, so we go out and we mow the lawn and we use that to improve our knowledge as it stands. So today, um, a lot of the world isn't covered by modern um, survey techniques. It's reliant on satellite altimetry data, which is awesome, depending on the research question that you're wanting to ask. But for me, the devil's in detail. So if we take the same area on the top left, we have the satellite altimetry data over um, a fracture zone. And on the right, that is um, some survey data that we acquired last year. So the devil really is in the detail because then we can start to look at, well, how uh, is that um, fracture, that tectonic linear in, in the tectonic plate, how is that behaving? How old is it? Has it split apart you know, relatively recently? Is it still active? We can start to look at um, seamount chains. You know, so the image on the, the bottom there, these are some seamount chains that were not known from the satellite altimetry data. And from my point of view, uh, I am a blue skies research scientist, but I also like to be more applied. So I'm starting to think, well, we can see that there are submarine landslides on the flanks of some of those um, seamounts. So what is the impact of them? Where are they potentially tsunamigenic? Some of these seamounts are very close to some of the small island nations in the Pacific. What are the impacts of those low-lying nations? So we can start to, is it something that has failed once or is it something that is um, a, a, a sort of poly-event um, situation? So is it something that is failing an awful lot? Is it going to fail again sometime soon? Are those volcanoes active today? You know, are, you know, there's all of these other sort of questions that we're asking and what are the impacts of those? But I mean, the bottom line now is um, there's a, the, the group uh, Jebco and Seabed 2030 have got this amazing um, project um, to basically map using modern techniques the entire ocean floor by 2030. 
Um, they probably aren't going to do it, but there's an awful lot of um, momentum behind that, and pretty much everybody who's anybody is submitting their data that they acquire to that initiative to try and help build up a more detailed picture. But the bottom line is that 74% of our global oceans are unmapped, and most of the the sort of 20-odd uh, percent that is mapped is on continental shelves, because, of course, that's where a lot of the resources and that's where a lot of the interests are. It's not where all of the interest is. So um, that, of course, is the difference between sort of mapped and the satellite altimetry, as I was saying. So I'm, um, I'm involved in something called Inkfish, and um, I mainly work on the Open Ocean, uh, Open Ocean Program, but we also have a Coastal Seas Program. But basically, we have a vessel that is very uniquely um, sort of kitted out to look at some of the deep water areas of our planet. So anything that's sort of three, 4,000 meters and deeper. Um, so of course, you know, we're gonna be drawn towards those really kind of sexy things like your subduction zones and your fracture zones, you know, but actually we're using that time effectively and every time we're crossing an ocean basin we're doing scientific research we don't just sort of steam across we're actually stopping on the way collecting as much information and we're making that information open access as well and why do we do that well that's because most of our planet is deeper than 4,000 meters it's blue planet that's a pacific ocean it's over 50 percent of our planet and most of it is deeper than 4,000 meters. And how much do we know about it? Not that much. So that's why we do it. Because until you know, the reason that I put that map, map up there is because it was to demonstrate, it's a very unusual way to look at the Earth, sort of looking at Antarctica down and everything's wrapped around about it, but everything's connected. Do you see many land sort of bridges separating everything? No. So. Why should we exclude studying something that is over 50% of our planet and the Indian Ocean, that's another huge part of our planet, you know, most of the, the Atlantic, just because it's hard, just because it's deeper than 4,000 meters? Some of us don't think we should because everything's connected and everything matters and at some point it's all going to end up in the same system. So we need some baseline data so that we can monitor change and start to look at what, what is going to happen in the future, for example. Anyway, that was a little bit <sighs> crikey. That was intense, right? Come on, li liven it up, Heather. So what are we using? Right, okay, we're using um, scientific landers. We've got um, other vessels that are coming online um, later on. But right now, um, the workhorses of our research program are scientific landers and the green machine back in AMA um, in the bottom there, which is our uh, two-person submersible. So the landers in the top image there um, they, we also have the ability to take um, physical samples from those as well. And, but mainly we're looking at sort of we've got an array of instruments that we attach to those um, things and we try to cover everything in, in purple at the bottom there. We're studying the geology, the biology, ocean currents. You know, we're trying to cover as many things as possible. Whenever you spend that amount of money to go out there, you know, we want to make sure that we're doing everything as comprehens comprehensively as possible. Um, we're taking water samples, geology samples, biology, we're recording video, we've got information on the water column, turbidity centres, we've got all sorts on there. Back in Awa, of course, the landers sort of descend to the seafloor and then they stay static. What we have with a submersible is the ability to actually do transects and if you could imagine that you are sat um, on Eilly, and you're walking along and you're actually recording what you're doing. So, I mean, it's traditional geology, in my opinion. You're walking along the seafloor and you're recording your observations. You're making measurements about bedding, directions, dip, strike, you know, fossiliferous content. Well, we're getting there. Not quite yet, but we will do. Um, whether there's ash layers present in that, if we're looking at volcanic glass. You know, we, we are doing traditional geology using a submersible, which is actually a little bit novel. It's a little bit unusual because usually a lot of that is um, done through maybe art remotely operated vehicles, so your little uh, sort of robot cubes, except some of them can be the size of cars. Um, and, but those 
can't cover as much ground as we can with the submersible. So that's, that's a sort of little difference there. And it's um, a nested resolution of scale. So we've got the seafloor mapping from the vessel. We've got the fine detail mapping from the submersible as well. And the, the lander is superimposed on top of that. Um, I'm usually asked, um, I have been very, very fortunate enough to do a number of dives in the submersible. And, um, and we'll get onto some of that data just shortly. But just to give you a little um, flavor there, most of the volume of the vessel is actually all of your flotation. So that's what's going to get you home, right? <laughs> the stuff that you drop at the bottom, your um, surfacing and freeboard weights are, are right at the bottom of the vessel. The little thing that looks like it's got teeth, that's your, uh, your sphere that uh, myself and the pilot will be sort of sat in. The bits that are actually the teeth, that's your oxygen supply. Um, but everything, everything that is essential is within that sphere. Everything else that is heavy is outside the sphere and can be jettisoned if need be. And we will always come home because there's enough foam round about to actually bring us home. So it's, um, and everything is tested to uh, like the nth degree. Um, it's, it's an incredibly safe vehicle and I've never ever once had any sort of queries about going in it. So um, of course it's the it's one of the more recent in a long line of uh, of uh, submersibles and vehicles that are capable of going to full ocean depth as we call it. So it's anything deeper than sort of uh, ten thousand meters full ocean depth. Of course, is Challenger Deep. That's uh, ten thousand nine hundred twenty-five. And there's actually only four vehicles that have ever been able to do that. So there are lots of other submersibles that manage to get down to sort of six six and a half thousand. But once you, know, you start getting a little bit beyond that, people start getting a little bit scared. Um, so of course, 1960, we've got the Trieste on the top uh, left there. That was uh, Don Walsh and, and Jacques Picard went down there in 1960. And they only did one. And they spent about 20 minutes on the seafloor and came back. Uh, 2012 was when uh, Jack, uh, James Cameron went down in Deep Sea Challenger which is the, the top uh, right picture there with this sort of vertical green machine. Um, I had noticed as I put this slide together that everybody's gone for green recently. You know, it's, green seems to be the cool color at the minute. So that was uh, 2012. Unfortunately, um, it did a number of uh, trials cruises. Well, trials cruises, um, I think the deepest one before Challenger Deep was 8,000 meters in the New Britain Trench. And then it did Challenger only made one trip to Challenger, and, um, and it was donated to science, but unfortunately it caught fire um, on its way to Woods Hole. So it never um, flew again. Uh, this is uh, Dean um, sitting on top of our uh, submersible Baku on the bottom left there. And on the right is a Chinese vehicle called um, uh, the, the English equivalent is Driver. And um, so we've got 1960, 2012, 2018 is when our, um, our submersible came online, and 2020 is when the, the Chinese vehicle came online. So just now, it's, it's kind of hard to sort of gauge, but I think there's only been, you know, it's not that many, like 50 odd dives deeper than um, sort of 10,000. So it's not that many. And a lot of these vehicles don't take many people as well. So it's, it's a bit of an exclusive club. So I'm um, getting on to a bit of the, the research. Uh, so if you'll be pleased to know that I've, I've stopped my historical um, uh, look back through rose tinted glasses. But um, the Novocanton trough, so what is exactly a fracture zone, just in case you're, you're a bit unclear. So there, we're not looking at something that's right on a mid-ocean ridge. So the Novocanton trough, which is um, a place that we were, we were just um, around about Easter to early summer this year, it's an extension of the Clipperton Fracture Zone, which you might be familiar with. It might have popped up in your, in your heads. It's uh, talked about a lot in terms of polymetallic nodules in deep sea mining. And the Novocanton Trough is just the other side of the Line Islands. It's just west of the Line Islands. It's an extension of the Clipperton Fracture Zone. There we go. So a fracture zone, so we've got the mid-ocean ridge, of course, the, the sort of magma upwelling at that mid-ocean ridge. It doesn't upwell at the same rate across the entire thing. So we get offsets, and those active offsets are called transform faults. 
but the sort of tectonic traces that can go for thousands of miles across the Pacific, uh, not just the Pacific, sorry, but the, the ocean floor, those are the fracture zones. And they're actually not active. You know, so there's no earthquakes or anything. All of the activity is right on the mid-ocean ridge and in that sort of transform fault that goes between the, the active portion of the, of the ridge. So the actual big, long gashes along the abyssal plain, you can see them, the Murray, Molokai, Clarion, Clipperton, Galapagos, Macquarie's. They're massive, sort of really obvious bathymetric features. And, um, and where we were working, you know, the, the average number of earthquakes was 0 0.25 a year. You know, so it's, it's really, it's tectonically and seismically quite quiet, but that doesn't mean to say that it's not um, interesting. So a little bit of a, a sort of zoom in, just a few kind of flavors from the, the seafloor mapping. A lot of seamounts that weren't known. We can see just in the sort of central top image there, you can see the sort of big tectonic lineaments. So that sort of dark blue sort of lozenge in the middle, that's the sort of deep part. That's about 8,000 meters water depth. But it's bound, it's, it's like an opening set of scissors. So that's a, a record of how that portion of the fracture zone was opening at that time. We've got other sort of uh, tectonic uh, lineaments. So those, those clear lines that you're starting to see in the, in the top right there that are also sort of part of this te tectonic history that um, is about 30, 30 million years old. But the sort of perpendicular little sort of stripes that's a record of the seafloor spreading fabric that was created way back at the East Pacific Rise, sort of, you know, <laughs> way, way back. So we've got all of these little sort of sections of, um, of uh, geological history overprinting and being captured and preserved, and the sedimentation rate in this area is really low. So we can see all of that just plain as day on the seafloor. We can see um, other sort of elements of, of the tectonics. So we can see um, fossilized fracture zones that are sort of sitting at a, at a different angle from the, the, the main sort of deep lozenge, that, that sort of um, primary one that is the, the most recent part of the, of the evolution of this area. We've got petite spot volcanism. So that central lower um, image there, all the little sort of pimples that are on the seafloor. We've got lots of tiny little volcanic knolls that are, that are sort of puncturing and interrupting that sort of flat seascape because I think when I talk to a lot of people they can get a bit it's sort of like well isn't it all just a bit flat and smooth and a bit dull like oh really not <laughs> I wouldn't be going away from home away from my family if it was all a little bit dull so we, we start to sort of unpick the the story because what us as geologists like to do, we like to tell a story, don't we, of the landscape. We like to sort of unpick the age of all of the different events that have impacted that area. So instead of landscape, think about seascapes. And seascapes are just as dynamic. They're just covered in water. So the other part that I'll talk about uh, just shortly and present some more data on is the Tonga Trench. So I'm actually just back from the Tonga Trench. And the Tonga Trench, of course, is one of the fastest subducting plate boundaries in the world at, at the current time. It's, um, we've gone from uh, the Nova Canton Trough with its uh, 0 0.12 earthquakes a year to somewhere like Tonga that is just absolutely peppered and obscured. And actually, as a little uh, story aside, when I was there, we were alongside the, the sort of visiting berth is right outside the king's palace in the kingdom of Tonga. So we're alongside. I happen to be having a little uh, post-lunch sort of relaxation in my cabin. And then the whole ship goes... <laughs> Turned out it was a 6.9 Richter earthquake alongside. Uh, nobody died, no tsunamis, no structural issues, but I did have a bit of a geology moment because uh, we don't tend to get too many earthquakes like that you can feel around about here. So I had a little bit of a bucket list, so oh, I've done one. <laughs> we all thought that, uh, of course, the, the chief engineer got a little bit of stick because it sounded like he was messing about with the engines. <laughs> so I kind of came out of my cabin. I was like, Paul, what are you doing with the engines? And he was like, I'm not doing anything. We're all alongside. They're off. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. So it turned out it was, a, it was a really quite significant earthquake. Well, significant, I thought, but everybody else local was just like, yeah, whatever. Anyway, right back to the story. Um, so a very, very different setting. We've gone from a fracture zone 
uh, to a very fast moving plate boundary subduction setting and those sort of uh, where uh, how to describe this I should have put some more labels on apologies on the right hand side where you have fewer spots um, that's the underriding plate so that's the one that is getting bent underneath the Australian plate and those lines that you can see are basically if you think about if you took a wooden ruler um, when you were at school and started like twanging it against the table and as that twang is going it's actually making the ruler break that's exactly what's happening here they're called bend related fault escarpments and those are coming into the the trench um, axis um, the Tonga Trench hosts the second deepest place in the world the horizon deep which is 10,816 meters deep and on that overriding plate, and I'll show some zoom-ins um, as the rest of the presentation goes, but we've got a lot of different processes. We've got some remnants of tectonic fabric, which I wasn't expecting, actually. We've got a lot of canyons coming in in the shallower water areas in the far sort of uh, left of the, the image. We also have a lot of um, submarine landslides. And of course, you know, thinking about uh, sort of recent geological phenomena around about this region, you know, they're, they're very interested in terms of... Um, things that may or may not cause tsunamis, for example. So we're working with the Tongan government as well to make sure that we're giving all of this information and all of our findings to them so that they can make um, informed decisions going forward. So um, what sort of things do we find in the deep? And I'm going to start talking uh, about different disciplines. So one of the favourite things in my job is that I get to work with biologists, oceanographers, engineers, you know, everybody from the captain to the, the galley staff, everybody on board is important in the conversations because if we can't talk to everybody on board and they can't input into the research that we're trying to do as well, you're never going to come up with anything new. You're never going to come up with something innovative. So it's very much a team sport on, um, on the mighty Dagon. Um, so I'm going to present a sort of whistle-stop tour, um, initially looking at the biology, but there's going to be some geology interspersed, and then I'm going to finish up with a few sort of biology highlights, uh, geology highlights, sorry, at the, at the end there from the Nova Canton and uh, Tonga trenches. Um, but uh, hopefully you'll, you'll enjoy some of the, the images that we're, we're looking at. So just to start off with, um, when we were there, um, it was humpback migration season, which we hadn't really appreciated uh, was going to happen. Of course, these pictures were taken by the people uh, two weeks before I got on board. <laughs> so I didn't get to see quite as spectacular as this, but it was still pretty spectacular when I was there. Um, but let's, uh, let's dip our heads underneath the water a bit more. So these are just some of the, um, the sort of best of, sort of pictures, but it was just to give you a flavour just quickly, because I'm not going to be able to talk about everything in the time that I've got available. So on the left there, we've got some of the typical sort of fish that we see. Um, and those go from the sort of the shallower water, sort of, you know, something that you might find in less than a thousand metres, shallow, um, to some of the deepest um, fish in the world, which is, is number K there, this little purple guy. But I'll show some more pictures of him shortly. The middle section, um, the, when I talk about something called um, Hadal, which is a bathymetric term, you know, so you've got your um, bathial, pelagic, um, uh, abyssal, and Hadal. Hadal is anything more than 6,000 metres. And traditionally, it used to be called the kingdom of the Holothurians. And the Holothurian are these guys in the middle called sea cucumbers. It's little sort of like sausage type guys with little sort of legs and like sort of pokey up bits. I find them quite intriguing, but a little bit... I worry that if I poke them, they would burst. But, you know, anyway, we don't manage to retrieve them because they're very delicate. Um, so the kingdom of the Holothurians, so the sea cucumbers that we meet. We, of course, see lots of um, sea stars as well. We see lots of sponges, corals. The group in the middle there are something quite cryptic called xenophyophores. Um, they have lots of different morphologies, so their shapes are very varied, varied sorry. Um, but literally nobody really knows what, what is going on with those because they're so incredibly difficult to sample. So they're a type of foramin foraminifera. Um, and they're sort of brown in colour because they're using sort of sediment to help build their skeleton, but they're incredibly delicate. So if you try and sample them, they just crumble into nothing. 
So they're, they're incredibly cryptic. And, um, and lots of different types of uh, jellyfish as well. And those were deep. Those were like sort of seven, 8,000 meters, which I wasn't really um, expecting either. So um, about 1,000 meters, you know, you get lots of uh, sort of grenadiers. Um, grenadiers are a type of um, fish that we find everywhere in the world. They're possibly the most prolific or abundant uh, sort of fish uh, on the planet. We also, because um, whenever we go into these sort of areas, because they're not very well studied, they're underfunded um, in terms of research, so we often find sort of new things. So that's uh, the whiplash squid, squid, also called the, the love heart squid. So you can see whenever its, um, its mantle was sort of coming around there, it made this lovely love heart shape. Um, so we get to sort of see some of these really unusual um, creatures as well. What I love about this uh, the squid there is that when he turns around, you get to see his lovely blue eye with the little white section. And then as he sort of drifts off, he closes his eye. There you go. He's just living his best squid life. Um, so that's about 1,000 metres um, water depth. We will find a lot of these grand deers. We also find um, deep sea skate and rays. Um, a little bit deeper, so it's just over a thousand meters. This was an incredibly rare sighting. Um, this is a Dana um, hooked squid, and um, it has the biggest photophores, so the little uh, green lights that you see coming on. Those are each are, each one is the size of a lemon. Um, there was some confusion, or well, not confusion, debate around the the squid community. You know, we we sort of put that out, out there because we didn't know much about them. I'm a geologist, not a squid person. But um, they were saying, oh, you know, we don't know if we use them for hunting or courtship. And so I was like, no, I'm pretty sure it's not trying to court Melander. Uh, I think I think it's trying to go for the bait and it missed it and went for the for the, the camera. But it, that uh, that species is uh, it's just under a meter long because we know the exact dimensions of the lander. So we can sort of measure, sort of scale it up for the size of the, the squid as well. But these things are usually, I think they've only been recorded a handful of times before. Um, they've only really been seen in physical form, either washed up dead on a beach or within the stomachs of whales. So it was quite unusual to get that sort of um, footage. We also see things like deep sea sharks. Um, which is which is kind of cool, but if you can take your eyes off the shark for a moment, this is in Tonga Trench. We start to see a lot of volcanoclastic debris, which we were we were expecting in the Tonga Trench, but also it's um, it's a, a sort of it's a, it's a got a, a sort of a range of sizes. They're all very angular, you know, relatively uh, close to source as well. Yeah, it's quite big. Uh, the Pacific sleeper shark, so it's normally found in the northern hemisphere, of course we're in the Tonga Trench, but there was a record in the Indian Ocean and in the Solomon Isles as well. Um, so there's, this is the third sighting that of the Pacific sleeper shark in the southern um, hemisphere. It really had a go at our lander, like <laughs> we didn't realise until it came back, so lander looked fine. But from the start of the its time on the seafloor to the end, it had like, been literally picked up and carried by this shark. So the shark's quite happy, it's getting a free meal. But um, yeah, yeah. after we sort of you know, brought it back, it was like, oh God, you know, how's our camera okay? Because he literally tried to eat it. Um, as I said, the sort of volcanoclastic um, and the in situ sort of bedrock that we're seeing down there. So <coughs> these are images um, taken from our submersible. Uh, as long as we're above the carbonate compensation depth, which is about uh, 4,500 to 5,000 metres in this area, um, we get a lot of corals, actually, even down very, very deep. And what is cool about some of these corals is that when you zoom in, you find that they have other species sort of sitting on them. So the image on the right there, we've got um, sort of various species of um, brittle star and sea stars that have crawled up, obviously, to get away from the sediment up into the water column so that they can filter feed and um, live uh, a very nice sort of sea star life. Um, we see urchins, other types of corals, sea pens. We see eels down to about sort of 3,000 metres as well, or thereabouts. 
We see something that, uh, sort of slightly more unusual. Um, we see whale feeding gouges, evidence of whale feeding, um, right down, you know, over 3,000 meters um, water depth. And looking at the literature, it looks like these are probably made by um, sort of species beaked whale. And um, it's, it's still up for debate as to what they're actually doing. Are they eating, you know, like your your sea cucumbers and such like, or are there are some schools of thought that wonder whether whales take on ballast as well so they're actually looking for for stones and things to take on board so but we've, we've seen them in a couple of other places now so um we've got some people that are looking into that and publishing that right now something that i really love just because they look a little bit goth um we get tube dwelling anemones down them um, really actually quite deep but i think you can sort of think that these things are quite sort of small so this is some footage from one of my dives and the laser points if you sort of see them in the, in the middle of the, the footage there that's about 20 centimeters so the the tentacles on this sort of black tube dwelling anemone are about half a meter sorry that's not half a meter half a meter there we go so i mean they're really really quite quite large they come in a lot of various um uh sort of uh colors and stuff but ones that i've seen tend to be they're either attached to sort of very obvious sort of uh, bedrock you know quite often in these sort of areas that we're looking in that bedrock has got a coating of um, manganese on it um, but often we're finding them associated with polymetallic no nodules as well and you can see some of the nodules on the sort of bottom right um, section of that that image as well i said lots of um, different types of sea star um, that we're, we're coming across as well we see some really quite unusual sort of things. We see these little sort of hermit crabs um, with uh, symbiotic uh, organisms living on their backs. Um, in my head, this guy has gone, oh, oh, he's just like mooching around. He's going, oh. And just to point out that I have sped up that video, it's like 10 times faster. That guy is not moving fast, not with that guy on his back. So as I said, these um, grenadiers, we find them right way down to uh, about just shy of uh, 6,000 metres. We find eels, um, we find decapods and um, hermit crabs as well, really in, in surprisingly deep depths, I think. Um, carrying on some of the squid story, but also as we're, we're looking there, we're starting to, I'm going to build on the volcanic story as the, the talk sort of goes on in a few slides time. But we use these sort of lander footage. These are sort of static images of the sea floor, and they might not mean much when you just have one or two, but whenever you've collected, you know, 110 in one location, you start to build up a really nice picture about what is going on. And then you add and you layer on top of that your submersible dives as well. And then you put all that in context using your sea floor multi beam sort of map of the area as well. Now, just to sort of point out, we have not done anything to that guy. I don't know what is going off on off camera. He's, I don't know whether he's sort of hunting something or something has uh, caught him, but it's nothing to do with us. Just, you know, no squid were harmed in the making of this show. So, um, more anemones, um, usually attached to um, some of the lovely bedrock. So I, I think that's some of my joy at some of this work. So as I'm looking at... Um, the geological formations and the sheeted dike complexes and the pillow basalts and such like. Um, we're also acquiring data for all of these other disciplines at the same time. So these guys then come and look at the footage that I'm taking just as I do with them. So they're doing some of their sort of pure biology transects, but they're still going across the ground and the ground is geology. So it's all, it's all sort of a, a lot of back scratching goes on and we get some truly um, amazing um, images. This, is, this red guy here is another tube-dwelling anemone. Again, the, the sort of sea cucumbers, and we see them all the way down to full ocean depth. So we see them in the bottom of Challenger Deep, in the bottom of Horizon Deep, and many of the other um, places. Uh, we find new species all the time. So this is a previously unseen, unknown um, type of octopus. We don't have a clue who it is. We sent these images and video off to some experts, and. Uh, they've not seen it before, so they're busy describing it from the, the footage. I love um, these cusk eels go down um, to just over uh, 6,000 metres, the cusk eel in the middle and on the left. And um, I always think they don't move very fast. And if you notice that all of these um, fish species, they don't have a forked tail. They don't have a sort of split tail. 
Um, and that's, that's because if you have the sort of traditional forked tail, that's so that you can, get, you can escape quickly. Whenever you're down at these water, water depths, nothing is kind of hunting you really quickly. So you don't need to worry about trying to expend that sort of energy and also that energy to grow that sort of tail as well. So you just have that sort of whip-like tail. Um, but these guys, they just sort of cruise around so slowly and they just look like zeppelins. They just sort of, they just point themselves into the, into the, the direction of the bottom water current and they just crundle up and they eat the little, uh, the little white spots round about. They are amphipods and I'll talk about them just shortly, briefly. Um, and they're, they're just soaking up the, the amphipods. Um, we see lots of um, lovely sponges. I like the ones that are that are on the rocks because, of course, that means that there's um, in situ bedrock cropping out in the seafloor that I can get very excited about. But uh, you find sponges on the soft sediment um, plains as well, but they've got a very different shape. Um, we're really lucky that we see. Um, I actually recorded that footage in the sub, looking out the viewport. The the octopus came. This is six thousand meters down, and the octopus came and played in the viewport. Um, I haven't got the sound on because um, that is where the, my pilot, who is a wonderful, wonderful uh, woman, one, one of the pilots, but uh, the only female pilot, uh, Kate Wawaitai, um, and she is like, oh my God, I love octopus, that's my spirit animal. <laughs> so she was having an absolute moment because this, uh, this octopus was coming up to, to play in the viewport. But if you ignore the octopus, um, the section in the middle there is actually um, sheety dike complex. So we're looking at um, sort of mantle rocks that are cropping out in the seafloor in this fracture zone area. So we can start to think about the evolution of these um, areas over time as well. Um, and then we saw multiple octopus. Um, they're really quite hard to sort of um, find these mobile um, animals, as you as you can imagine. They're on the move, you know. And we are just uh, we only do sort of one dive every few days, so. We're incredibly lucky to see them. But you can see the, uh, the images here are from the Nova Canton Trough. And something that's a bit of a dilemma is that we actually found a lot of polymetallic nodules in this area. So it's um, a lot of, we're spending quite a bit of time having a look at uh, delineating. Of course, I'm a, I'm a survey geologist, so I like to know exactly where something is and draw a line around it and um, better understand it. Um, of course, just because we have polymetallic nodules in the area doesn't mean to say that they are of any sort of economic value at all. Um, it very much, uh, they, they depend on, on region and, um, and source as well. So that's, that's another element that we're, we're looking at. So amphipods, um, bizarrely amphipods, uh, I'm doing a little bit of work with some of the biologists looking back through geological time. So some species of amphipods, you only find them in uh, water depths deeper than 6,000 meters. So thinking about geological evolution and um, plate tectonics, and you can look at a bit like, uh, was it Darwin's finch? You know, so in terms of the, the genetic diversity and when they would have spread from a single sort of genetic uh, species and trying to put that into some sort of context in terms of uh, plate tectonics and evolution through um, a number of tens of millions of years. So that's a, a little sort of side project. But um, these, I mean, there's millions of them. I mean, we catch them not very, it doesn't take a genius to catch them, and uh, they come up in their hundreds. But out of, uh, as a little bit of a, an aside, um, Things like uh, snailfish, which is uh, the deepest fish uh, known and recorded, they love them. So they sort of sit and all of the little spots are all these little amphipods. They are attracted to the bait that we've attached to our um, lander and we're recording. And these little goofy fish come along and hoover up the amphipods. If you note the... just. <laughs> Snailfish are really funny because they're, they're made of gel, effectively. If you shine a light through them, you can see all of their organs, which is kind of cool and a little bit icky. But um, the shiny part um, that you see just sort of uh, next to their fins in the middle um, is their liver. There's also a dark patch on them, and that's their stomach because, um, amphipods aside, quite a lot of things down there bioluminesce. And if you're made of gel, whenever you eat something, you don't really want it bioluminescing in your tummy and advertising where you are. So they've actually sort of shielded their stomach in black so that the, the bioluminescence doesn't shine through 
all of their gel body. So a little, uh, little kind of um, weird kind of um, uh, snailfish fact. We're starting to get really deep though. Um, snailfish um, are found down to about 8,400 meters. Um, so we, we start to, to lose the diversity as we go deep, but that doesn't mean to say that there's nothing there. There's lots of different types of worms. These are types of scale worms. You get spoon worms and, and lots of other type worms. I have to admit, I really try to get on board with scale worms, but I just don't like them. I, they just give me the heebie-jeebies and I don't really know why, but um, they are down there. But one of the things that um, as a little uh, sort of geology Glasgow University uh, graduate, um, I've got a bit of a thing for crinoids or, or sea lilies as they're, as they're known. And I can just have um, Chris Burton for anybody that maybe remembers him at the department. Um, he took um, us down on a field trip to Malvern and the Wenlock limestone, of course, has got lots of bits of crinoid in them. And I have to admit, it took me a little while to realise that they're still living today. <laughs> I thought, you know, as I'm, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, that, you know, that was a snapshot in geological time. And, um, and it, it actually kind of tickles me. And we find these, um, yeah, down to about seven, seven and a half thousand metres. Um, there's an amazing crinoid garden in the Japan Trench, not too far from the epicentre of that 2011 um, mega earthquake. Um, but we we find them um, sort of all over, but in, in deep waters, in deep waters. But I just think about Chris Burton every time I, I find a crinoid. So a um, little bit of a little bit of a strange aside. So um, that was a, a sort of shallow to deep uh, sort of biology with a little flavour of geology thrown in. But some of the, I mean, this is really quite hot off the press. We've only been working in some of these areas uh, for the last like. A few months so we've got a team sort of doing an awful lot of analysis um there's quite a bit of head scratching going on as well as anything sort of blue skies and new does um present so uh this is a uh, back an hour of course but i mean if you can sort of take your eyes off back an hour we've got an amazing array of um pillow basalts and in some of the regions you know you can see the different flows you can see where the pillow basalts, the individual pillows are actually failing. You can see the fractures at their, at their sort of behind and, their, and round about the basal sort of sections of them. And you can see the little cannonballs that they then become sort of rolling down um, the, the slope that we're, we're flying up as well. Um, you can also see the ash and the volcanoclastic deposits in between those as well and um, igneous intrusions in a lot of the, the areas that we're going to too. And I probably should have changed the slide as I was saying all that um we've got the soft um, flat plains which in places like the nova canton trough you know are, are that sort of you know that dark lozenge in the middle it is just featureless it is just this massive flat plain a bit like this if you cast your mind back to um the tonga trench and those bend related faults remember the the ruler analogy where those faults sort of crisscross they form these fault bounded basins and so in the middle of those basins, again, we're looking at these major sort of depot centers for sediments. And what we've been doing as part of a project with the, the Danes, um, based out of the University of Southern Denmark, is that we can look at turbidite deposits triggered by historical earthquakes just over the last 100, 130, uh, 150 years. So we're tying in the sedimentary record with the active records today. And, um, and we've managed to get that, that published as well. As I said, we're seeing um, vast plains of manganese um, nodule fields across not just the Nova Canton area, we've not found very many in Tonga actually, but across the, the Pacific as well during some of our transits across the Pacific. And, um, and we see an awful lot of, uh, of uh, jointing and fracturing of some of these um, igneous uh, intrusions and sheeted basalt, uh, sheeted dike complexes, sorry. Um, and the, the joints and fractures are taking advantage, uh, excuse me, taking advantage of these planes of weakness within the, the rock mass. But these are also becoming planes to be exploited by um, fluids that are circulating within that rock mass. So we're starting to see hydrothermal alteration as well. So we're seeing a lot of bright colours, you know, your bright yellows, your bright whites and things around about these um, planes of weakness and these faults and stuff as well. So that's another um, line of uh, research that we're, we're looking at. 
as I hinted, um, hinted upon, you know, the, the submersible footage is amazing, but also these static images from the, the, the landers that traditionally were used to look at the biology, so the mobile biology that we see at these, um, these places, your amphipods and your fish. But a handful of those static images don't mean much, but when you've collected a few hundred, they start to count for quite a lot. So one of the projects that one of my postdocs is looking at um, and has actually just submitted yesterday, so um, we, we had cake, um, is to take all that, um, all of those static images, classify them to look at uh, not just the, the visual image, but also to interrogate a lot of uh, databases to see what other physical samples are nearby because a visual image is only as good as the person that's actually looking at it a little bit. But if you start to ground truth that with physical samples from, um, from a lot of the, the databases, uh, the International Ocean Discovery, the, the drilling program um, is one of them, but um, Pangea, which is a big German database, is another one. Um, we can start to actually put some like physical descriptions and uh, interpretations associated with some of those images as well. And we can start to, there's a lot of predictive maps of um, seafloor sediments globally. So we can start to test those maps and to also feed back and to um, improve those maps as well. Oh, oh maybe, oh, I just put this in for fun. So this is, uh, I showed this image earlier with the pillow basalts, but uh, that's kind of, that's, that's us, that's uh, Tim McDonald, one of the, the some pilots and myself coming up over an escarpment. We'd just been to the Median Ridge in uh, Nova Canton Trough and, um, and realised that we'd come across one of our own landers. So we came in for a bit of a selfie, which was um, very decadent of us, you know, because we shouldn't have really done that. But, um, but it was a little bit of fun to get a little, a little picture of our lander and for it to get a picture of us as well. But that was the end. Um, when we do a scientific transect, we try and do at least four hours on the seafloor. And so that's four hours on the seafloor, and then you've got how, however many hours it is going down, and then you have many hours it is going back as well. So it's, it's a long day if you're down in the sub. This is um, literally one of the, the images, that one of the sections that I'm interpreting at the minute. Um, this is from the, the Tonga Trench. And if we ignore all the sort of fluffy white uh, sponges and stuff, we're starting to see that the sort of bright white layers are, are your ash layers. We're starting to see very glassy sort of uh, fragments of volcanic glass as well. Um, you've got your pyroclastic debris. Um, this is a sort of classic volcanoclastic um, succession um, within it. And this is about uh, 5,000 metres um, water depth. And the joy about sort of going down just as you would if you were doing um, a cliff section um, back on land here, you know, whenever you're sort of sat with your pilot, you know, you've got that flexibility and that ability to sort of say, you know what, this is actually really important. This is interesting. We need to stop here and do this properly. Or if we need to do a sort of transect to the left or to the right, or a port starboard if you're feeling a bit maritime. Um, then you can actually sort of do that, um, which is it is phenomenal. And, and as a geologist working in deep sea and have been for the last 23 years, you know this has been a game changer as far as um, my own interest and in research is concerned. Um, there are currents, so you can see that the, the sub is sort of um, uh, moving a little bit there. So there are actually currents near near seafloor currents that are actually cascading down over these uh, near vertical sections as well. These sort of brown sort of frondy things on the on the right there, those are dead sponges, and they are brown because sediment has become trapped in their skeleton and effectively smothered them. So working with the biologists, you can start to think, well, okay. They're actually attached to a near vertical sort of uh, section. You'd think that sort of smothering isn't an issue, so therefore it's probably some sort of um, turbidity current or something that has happened that has brought down um, soft sediments from above. I spoke before about these um, fractures forming planes of weakness. So on the right there, you can see that sort of slightly brighter, sort of yellowy um, white section. So that's uh, an area that we think has um, facilitated 
sort of water circulation. And of course, that isn't just sort of pure seawater anymore. That is water that is percolated down through the, the rock mass. It's dissolved some of those minerals and things um, from the rocks. And as it's sort of then coming out through these um, cracks and joints in the, in the, the rock mass, it's um, causing alteration um, as it goes. But you can also start to get a feeling for, if you look on the left there, you can see that some of that shadow, but you can actually see that that is starting to peel away. And so um, further down the, the video section that I didn't show here, you can see the spalling and the talus um, at the, the bottom of that as well. So, I mean, we're starting to sort of build up a picture, not just of kind of, well, how has this, what is this rock, but some of these um, other processes that are going on um, uh, at the same time. Um, just sort of looking at some of the submarine landslides, this is um, Tonga Trench. We're seeing um, a lot of these, but that whole uh, sort of section, you can see the sort of cauliflower bites um, delineated in the red dashes there. But in between, do you see that sort of um, straight line? And we can see that's some of the tectonic fabric. This is on the overriding plate. So this is on the sort of Australian tectonic plate, which is sitting on top of the Pacific plate, which is being thrust underneath. Um, but these are sort of tectonic lineaments, some sort of tectonic fabric that I haven't quite kind of figured out what is going on, why it's there yet. But, um, but it's forming this sort of uh, escarpment that is then, you know, failing. So it's, it's this sort of area that is actively sort of stepping back um, and in a number of different ways. And there's a number of different uh, types of landslide or slump processes going on from, um, from slumps to sort of retrograde sort of failure as well. But what is great is that we can then take the sub and fly up the head scarps and we can look at the, at the deposits as well to try and have a look and see what processes are actively going on at this time. And, um, and just as a, a sort of quick snapshot, you can actually sort of see um, different layers and different um, stages of um, failure as we're, as we're going. So um, just uh, finishing up, I uh, realise uh, that time is wearing on, but um, I hope that I've managed to sort of, well, one, I, I kind of, um, I realise I'm incredibly lucky, but I'm, I'm totally in love with my job. But the deepest places on earth are not out of sight, out of mind. Um, so everything is important and whatever we put in, in the rivers and stuff like that, it ends up eventually in some of these deepest places. So we need some sort of baseline data um, we need to be able to monitor change, keep going back to, to these areas um, to collect more data as well. And a lot of these areas are um, they're surrounded by nations that don't have access to some of the new technologies and the opportunities that we have. So something that's very much at the core of the work that we're doing just now is to work with these communities and these nations to make sure that they're involved, they have access to our data and also the the findings and the expertise and we're also um, sort of affording as much we can you know knowledge transfer as well and they are participating on our expeditions as well um, as I said you know like the multidisciplinary research you know I, I mean I am a geologist of course I'm going to be most excited about the geology but I think those conversations with um, different um, areas you know they, they really sort of spark things up you know because they will ask you a question and you're like oh something that you've maybe taken for granted and they say well why and it's like oh I, I don't know <laughs> so it makes you think and it spurs on those sort of um, conversations when you've just spent three weeks in bad weather with somebody and you're having your millionth cup of tea and you're starting to feel a bit sorry for yourself and sometimes that's those are the moments where the most interesting conversations take place um, and really you know just like whenever you're driving along, going up to my home village in Clin, you know, you look up at the slopes there and they're dynamic, there are changes going on. You know, it's exactly the same in the deep sea. It's not just some sort of barren, flat plain that does bugger all. It's actually really interesting. There's a lot of different processes going on and a lot of those processes are potentially um, important and impactful um, to, to the nations round about, the coastal nations round about. 
So thanks very much. And, um, and actually, this chap here on, on the left, he is Alan Scott. He is just, uh, he's from East Kilbride, not, not no, West Kilbride, sorry. And, um, and that's a picture of us at 10,445 metres deep. So I think that might be the deepest Scottish pair. And that just happened in August. So I can't decide what to call it, the full Scottish. I don't know, like, uh, yeah, the haggis. I don't know, right. But, um, but I don't know, I, there's not enough slides to sort of show every that makes this happen. But I mean, it's, a, it's very much team effort. And, um, and I'm very fortunate I get to work with a lot of lot very, very brilliant people. So thanks very much. Okay.
Cheers, Cheers mate. Cheers, Cheers, adventure buddy. Mm. Oh, it's delicious. Mm. Mm. Did Jess make that? Yep. Thanks, Jess. Yep. Thank you, That's Jess. That's brilliant. Oh, that's exactly what I needed at 7,800 meters before we got to the bottom. Hoorah! Class three five. Do you want a biscuit? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Thought you'd never ask. <laughs> Jesus Christ, Heather. Take a taste. <laughs>